Hello everyone and welcome to this inaugural lecture. In previous years, we all would have been together on campus for this event, but like last year, most of us have to get together virtually. If initially we thought that getting through this pandemic was going to be a sprint, we quickly came to realize that we are running a marathon, and now it has morphed into an ultra-marathon. But thankfully, we have been able to innovate, and by this stage, this new virtual reality where we see each other on screens has, to a certain extent, become the new normal. Regardless of the method of delivery, an inaugural lecture is cause for celebration and a huge milestone in an academic's professional life. It's an opportunity for someone recently appointed or promoted to full professor to share their research and insights with colleagues, students and the public at large. Interiere soos die is een van die hoekstene in die lewe van akademici. Dit bied aan gerespecteerde kenners in hulveld die geleentheid om openlik kennis te deel, iets wat sedert die ontstaan van universiteiten nog altijd deel was van die akademische project. And the plus side of this lecture being virtual is that its content can be shared and seen by a very large audience and educating generations to come. This quote by the biologist Thomas Huckley speaks to the quest of universities today. The medieval university looked backwards. It professed to be a storehouse of old knowledge. The modern university looks forward and is a factory of new knowledge. These words might have been spoken more than a hundred years ago, but they still ring true. Inaugural lectures are a prime example of where new knowledge can lead us. An affirmation of the cumulative effect in-depth knowledge can have on the career trajectory of an academic individual, and also a testimony to the influence academics have on their fields of expertise. Maar is professore steeds nodig in tye waar almal toegang tot een macht om inlichting het met net die druk van een knoppie? Ek wil sê meer so as ooit. Ons leef in tye waar ons op professore se kennis en inzig, ervaring en wijsheid moet kan staat maak. Daarom hou ons die amp van professor in stand en gee ons graag die geleentheid aan elk van ons professore om een interiere te hou. The science fiction writer and biochemistry professor Isaac Asimov's words come to mind. Anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural lives, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. In times of fake news, we have to celebrate the quest for true knowledge and the effort that accompanies it. So I congratulate our first time full professors on the journey you undertook to get here. And for our audience, I hope you enjoy the lecture. Hello. It's a great privilege for me today to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Marlies de Blanche Smith. One of the richnesses of working in a business school is the way it combines individuals with a business experience and experience in the wider economy with expertise in research and in the rigour and public publications in the global scale. I'm very pleased to say that Professor Marlies de Blanche Smith brings together these qualities. She's combined a history and a career of being a leader in business and consulting in fast moving consumer goods, as well as an academic pedigree that's led to over 40 publications, many research students succeeding in their, in their research theses, and all it all brings together a profile that leads to a high impact academic, just the sort of thing we need in a business school. Professor de Blanche Smith brings together an expertise in marketing, communications, branding and consumer behaviour. Her inaugural lecture entitled Modelling Consumer Choice Behaviour, a South African Wine Case, demonstrates this very clearly. Here her expertise in consumer behaviour is combined with 
a strategically important sector, such as the in the wine sector, that's key for the Western Cape, for Stellenbosch, and of course for South Africa as a whole. It demonstrates just the kind of impact that relevant and rigorous research can have for the wider ecosystem, for the community and for society. I'm extremely happy to welcome you to the inaugural lecture, Professor Marlies de Blanche-Smith. Honourable Vice-Chancellor, Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, Director of the Stellenbosch uh, University Business School, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honour to present this inaugural lecture. Before I share my research, a few words of gratitude to God, with whom I am nothing, for his mercy and grace and strength and carrying me through. To my colleagues, I appreciate your support and um, always uh, being there, uh, working together collegially. To a special word of thanks, and it's impossible to mention everyone, but to Professor Nick Tablanche, my academic mentor, who introduced me into this world of academia and is still carrying me through this journey. Then, thank you to my students, present and past. It is because of you that I do this and for you that I do this. Then thank you, Professor Martin Kidd, for your assistance with statistical analysis and the two MBA students on whose initial research this research was built and based. And then, then finally, special words of thanks. I will forever be grateful to Professor Charlene Gerber for her uh, always being there and for her assistance with this research. Then my heartfelt thanks to my family and friends. Thank you for your love and support. And finally, and most importantly, to my children, Manisha and Kaldu, I love you with all my heart. Thank you for understanding when I don't get work-life balance right. You are my inspiration. And then to the team sitting in front of me from, from uh, the Registrar's Office and uh, Corporate Communication and Marketing, I really appreciate all your trouble and especially your patience with me. So over to my presentation. I'm going to talk about modeling consumer choice behavior and specifically looking at a South African wine case. So before we start, just a quick background, what I'm going to discuss, background of the, and theoretical framework, then looking at our research objectives, methodology, results, conclusions and recommendations. I love this quote by Walter Landau. I think it actually is why I, why I joined and became a marketer. Products are made in a factory, but brands are created in the mind. So let's see through this research how important products and brands are, specifically what we do with brands. Right, quick background. We live in a changing consumer-oriented society with technological advances, increasing information overload, and also, because of this, diminishing brand loyalty. Now, product and brand choices are crucial to marketers. It's, it's crucial to market success, to build brand loyalty, and also to build consumer value. And this is why we have to look at first the theoretical framework before we can go into the detail. How do we make sure that we create this loyalty. Firstly, we, uh, the study took, I took a look at consumer behavior and purchase decisions, then consumer choice and product attributes, then looking at wine consumer behavior, and finally looking at the literature on consumer choice and wine attributes. Now, to start and do, to give a, a, a background and, and a model that explains how we extremely complicated human beings behave is the model of consumer purchasing process. And I want to quickly take you through this model to, to be able to, to go to the next step. So the model is really, it looks very complicated, but it's actually very easy. You have an input phase, a processing phase, and an output phase. So when consumer make, make, makes purchasing decisions, it's really complicated because there are external influences then they have a decision-making process and then a post-purchase behavior. Now, 
external influences actually influences the whole decision-making process, which is also influenced by a lot of psychological factors within the consumer. And this is then driven through to the final purchase and a post-purchase evaluation. And hopefully if you get repeat purchase, brand loyalty. Now marketing mix variables, the, the four P's as we know it, promotion, price, place and product, plays directly into this phase where the consumer sees I have a need, a, I do a pre-purchase search before I evaluate all the complex alternatives I just mentioned. Social factors like your culture, demographics, your social class and reference groups I'll come to later also feeds into this process. And then our internal factors, your motivation, perception, learning, memory and personality. Now what happens in this process, the consumer evaluates alternatives and then those alternatives are put into, into, into the black box really, goes into experience and in back into psychological processes. Or you would get after a post-purchase, the consumer also has experience of could be positive or negative of a product brand and that also drives back into experience. Now to complicate things a little bit, as consumers we don't go through this process from A to Z. We sometimes jump around or go back and only go through certain processes at one time. So moving on to, to the, the next phase, I want to move on to what the study was about. Now, when you do consumer behavior modeling, you choose a product to do it on because we want you to do choice modeling. And in this instance, we decided to use wine. Now, wine consumption is very low in South Africa, 10% of total alcoholic beverages. And in South Africa, our per capita consumption is also very low. If you think about, I was actually trying to figure out how much wine you drink in a month, like Portugal, with 59 liters in France, with 51, and Italy 44 per person per year. Now, a lot of studies have been done on wine consumer segments. So studies have been look, looking at social demographic factors that influence consumer behavior, the different consumer types, and then also expertise level. Are you a novice or are you an experienced wine? snob, so to speak. Right, so consumer, looking at the consumer view, this is how they feel. They feel winemaking is a very, purchasing is a very complex process because there are such a variety of products and cultivars to choose from. And then taste is very difficult because, because you cannot open a bottle of wine until you've purchased it. So it's a bit of a taste quality dynamic happening there. And this also increases the perceived risk the consumer experiences. Now moving on to choice factors and specifically attributes of wine as a product. Now I said earlier wine is complex because it has a lot of intrinsic attributes, the taste, sensory and, and all the other factors that, that the wine connoisseurs will tell you about. And then extrinsically, the way the consumer looks at it, the variety, the brand name, the packaging, etc. Now, researchers agree that consumers and their choices are influenced by taste of wine. Now, by the time you've tasted it, you've, you've purchased it already. And then also the brand name is linked to consumer benefits. So often a consumer purchases a brand because it's socially, socially acceptable and it will improve their self-image. And then they have to also infer quality, but they haven't tasted it. So normally, if the brand is expensive, they do the, the, the quality brand inference and the quality price inference, and they say that this brand must be good because it costs a lot. So there are different subsets of product attributes that we can look at when we do research on consumer choice in terms of wine attributes. Now looking at, before I get to the actual um, study and what we did, finally on the literature, looking at consumer choice and wine attributes, there are a um, number of studies have been done and I'm just giving you some highlights of these studies to show you what positives or th factors influence consumers more 
and what factors influence consumers less. Now, firstly, variety, vintage, and, and the actual producer was found by one study. Wine awards negative. Tasted previously, someone recommended it was positive. Alcohol level below 13%, not important. It's like we don't care. Region of origin, for some very important, although brand and price are not that important. Then region of origin often is important for high involvement consumers. Now these are consumers who take a lot of effort and who believe this product is really important to them when they purchase and they take, uh, uh, form this rational process to make a decision. For price, often for low involvement consumers, I'm not going to think about this uh, wine a lot. I just want a bottle of this wine and I, at that price and I go for it. Then tasted previously and someone recommended it comes out all the time. Origin not so much, vintage and price not so much. Then on premium wine, because we also looked at premium wine for this study, interesting that rep brand reputation, quality, and country of origin seems to be the factors that consumers look at. Also previous experience and recommendations, but not so much looking at price, which is expected from a premium brand and consumer because premium brands cost more than other brands. Now, coming to the actual research and our objectives, our main objective was to investigate consumer choice behavior pertaining to extrinsic product attributes of South African wines. Now, three things. We wanted to measure premium versus non-premium or slash regular wine attributes based on choice. And we tried to find research if actually compared premium versus non-premium wine consumers and we couldn't find anything. So we wanted to look at specific attributes and also look at if you have a different price point for premium versus regular wine, how would that affect the consumer's choice? So we wanted to evaluate wine attributes that drive consumer choice, and we want to provide guidelines to marketers, wineries, and retailers so they can use this information when they segment and target to premium and non-premium consumers. So the methodology we followed was a fractional experimental design. So this allows the researcher to reduce the number of treatment combinations when you do an experiment. So consumers are not bombarded with too many choices. So it's a combination of levels of choice attributes and you give this to the respondents. We selected 13 wine attributes to test and it was based on various global and local studies, especially a study by Goodman that was done across 12 countries that actually gave um, interesting results and was also repeated by other researchers. So for measurement, we used a questionnaire with a best worst uh, measurement scale and balanced incomplete block design. Now, a best worst scale has no verbal anchors. anchors. It's actually, actually either positive or negative, and you, you, the consumer uses use this to rate their preference. So if they're rated high, or if they're rated low. If I rate um, um, origin high or origin low or brand high, brand low. And then this, it was also shown by a number of researchers that a best with scale works really well across different cultural groups. Now respondents identified attributes from a different subset. Now there are differing subsets which indicated wine attribute choice selection and they had to, this was used through the balance incomplete block design where they actually in the end only chose from four specific attributes at a certain time which is done run, run across over the different attributes. So looking at our sampling and data collection, the primary data collection included wine consumers, minimum age 18 years as per South Africa, Net regulations and they must have purchased wine before. So we're looking at people who drink and who purchase and drink wine. The data was collected via a, a, a link on social media, specifically Facebook, bigger social media, etc. And then we used judgment sampling purely because it had to be wine drinkers, but also we had regular and, no, and, and or non premium and premium wine consumers. And the premium wine consumers who completed the survey 
had an additional screening question, they had to indicate that they would pay a minimum of 200 Rand for a bottle of wine. We got to that price point through uh, various databases and a search through retail to actually make sure that that is a good price point. Just to stress, we're talking about premium wine. I'm not talking about luxury wines where you pay 5,000 plus for a bottle of wine. So looking at the data analysis and the results, the non-premium wine um, or regular wine respondents, we had 335. The premium wine uh, respondents, 104. So prelim analysis was done and there was no significant differences between gender, age and wine consumption within the two groups. So they're very similar there. Female 55 and male 45% of respondents. So this is interesting and very similar to the South African wine drinking population. Most respondents were from 25 to 40 years, 45% of them. And this is also a, quite a main group of wine drinkers in South Africa. And then the, the non-premium majority was 43% and they earned between 21 and 60,000 per month. So they're in the mid to upper income group. And then the premium group, most of them, 35%, earn between 120,000 and up. So they're in your upper to top end income group. Now, getting to actual analysis, we ran manipulation checks to analyze the wine attribute scores. And we looked at wine consumption that was, that was conducted previously. Then we looked at prelim analysis to look for significant differences. We looked at frequency of wine and a frequency of wine consumption and choice scores with p-values higher than 5 and also looking at 0.5. And also gender and frequency of wine consumption. Again, no significant differences for that manipulation check. And the second one was done on the premium group where we also found no significant differences between the wine consumption and choice scores. Now getting into the first part of the results. Now the first part of the results is really an analysis of wine attribute scores and how consumers rated this. So for the non-premium group, I have highlighted the first four because this was the, the first four ranking that they gave. So for them, the most important product attribute of wine is that they tasted the wine previously. And secondly, someone recommended it, followed by grape variety and brand name. Now, I highlighted middle was not indicated in this group. That is why I marked it in red, but it is indicated in the premium group. These three lowest factors that don't influence them or influences them the least is promotional display in store, information on the shelf, and alcohol level below 13%. Could be that we all know alcohol levels are 12, maybe if it's a low, so-called low um, alcohol wine, and 13%. And it's interesting for retailers to note that promotional elements are not working as well, or are not as important as, um, as we would think for consumers in store. Now, looking at the premium group, Interestingly, tasted wine previously and someone recommended it again came out tops, then brand name and medal. Now, remember the non-premium group plays grape variety here and not medal, and the, the premium group actually plays grape variety right at the bottom here, which is quite a different selection. Now, these are just rankings. So most positive scores, most important to me as a consumer, write down to the most negative scores. Now, to, to, to get a, a slightly more in-depth picture, we looked for significant differences between those best worst scores, which is really important to look at. So for the non-premium group, we compared best worst scores and we, we found significant differences across all attributes with a p-value of um, 0 0.0, 0. So this is important. And then we did postdoc tests to reveal the scores and how they differ, differ significantly. This is the premium group if you look at the scores and you look at the various product attributes. You will see, as you saw in the previous table, that tasted the wine previously is here, and then someone recommended it there. So those are the top scores that, 
that you just saw and then going down to grape variety, brand name, medal and so forth down to alcohol level. So from most important to least important. But what we want to see to know if there's a significant difference between choices is if there's a significant difference between A and B for instance because there are no repetitive numbers indicated by the, the, the letters here. So, so A and B sig uh, differ significantly, so did B and C, i.e. someone recommended it in grape variety. But from grape variety right on to medal and award, there was no significant difference. So consumers in the non-premium group actually saw those things as all the same. So the f you can work with the first two and then have to remember that the, the other three are not significantly different. So for the premium group, it was almost the same. Sorry, that should say premium group, typo. Again, we found significant differences between the best worst scores. For the premium group, interesting, tasted previously, someone recommended similar to the non-premium, significant differences there. Also significant difference between someone recommended and brand name. But again, from brand name to medal and origin, brand name and medal and origin are not significantly different. You will see a C there and a C there. And medal awards and origin of the wine are also not significantly different, referring to the two Ds there. So no significant difference there. So we really have two overall broad significant attributes which is tasted the wine previously and someone recommended it to work from but the others are seen can be seen as ranked and also to know which is least important is important for further studies. So to conclude and make recommendations. So the non-premium and the premium groups, the, the choices were influenced by mostly the first and the second highest score which I mentioned tasted the wine previously and someone recommended it. And this concurs with findings of both South African and international studies. But it's important to remember when you look at premium consumers and non-premium consumers that there could be a different contextual basis. And I'm going to go to that now to, when I conclude and make some recommendations. So the results of the premium group differ somewhat from international premium wine studies. So no one has done what we have done to compare the two in the same, but they have looked at premium consumers on their own. And for most international studies, premium consumers look at medal and award and origin and brand. So in this instance, that came slightly lower for our consumers. So it's important for marketers and wine leaves and retailers to look at the results here and target premium and non-premium wine consumers separately, specifically relating to price when it comes to premium consumers. So looking at recommendations for the industry on the first um, product attribute, tasted wine previously. Now, the post-purchase evaluation in this instance, if you say I've tasted wine previously, it means that I've already tried it or tasted it. So this in that model of consumer behavior links back to the link on learning and memory, which is an experience that the consumer had before and they rely back on that. For non-premium, it's important that opportunities for trial is created like wine festivals, salad tastings, because taste is key. Consumers want to taste before they purchase and they cannot do that in store. Now, premium consumers normally buy directly from wine farms or sellers and tasting again here can be used very successfully because it will happen then during the consumer purchasing process. Now, in terms of retail complexity, the retail environment is extremely complex in South Africa, as you will know, regarding wine. So retailers can use these wine attributes identified to organize the wine area within a retail store, i.e. recommended wine, because recommendation was a very strong driver of choice. Also, tasted previously, they can give information on taste profiles, etc., which are, which are not really done specifically at the moment. Then also, 
the two other areas that came out, grape variety and brand name, can also be used to actually explain more to get a taste profile that the consumer understands that if I buy this, this is the taste I can expect as well as with a certain brand. Now, on the someone recommended it attribute, now this relates very directly to social cultural factors and reference groups that I discussed right at the beginning in the consumer behavior model. Now, non-premium consumers mostly rely on communication from reference groups like family and friends and bloggers, etc. The reason why we rec listen to others' recommendations is to minimize our risk. I don't want to buy wine that is not going to be good to drink. Then there's a growing need we find in, 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 um, under consumers to outsource decisions. It could be based on the whole idea that we are so overloaded, but we also have all this information at our fingertips. So by using social media and making recommendations there, winemakers can very successfully reach consumers, non-premium consumers, and give them actual recommendations on wine. Now, premium wine consumers, their recommendations relate to a social context mostly, and this would be social class. Now, there's an established link between con social context, social class, and how I feel about myself, my personal brand image. So it's important for them to get recommendations from people who they believe giving them brand and wine advice that will improve and enhance their image. They're also more likely to go into a high involvement decision process where recommendations and information is really, really important because high involvement is a rational process. So they want information, they want recommendations. Again, tasting information can be used to link to the previous attribute, but it's important when, when, when you look at this to do recommendations in, for instance, specialized wine magazines or get recommendations from experts like winemakers or wine critics and make sure that this consumer group is then targeted with those messages to feed into that social context and social status element. In terms of conclusions and recommendations for grape variety and brand name, specifically the non-premium group, selected grape variety as their third highest scores. Like I mentioned earlier, it's important to remember that grape variety didn't differ significantly from brand name or medal and award. So looking at this, it can be included in recommendations and it can be used very successfully with grape variety. You can make recommendations on food pairing or brands and certain grape varieties that the consumer will, will most likely be able to use with certain um, food recommendations and food choices. Then in the premium group, brand name was the third um, highest attribute and with the highest score. And this attribute also didn't differ significantly from medal or award and origin. So often wine enthusiasts link wine quality to origin and brand. Now this is important for the premium group because they will look at quality because that is what premium is to them. And that, this can easily be linked in communication, which also states then the brand and the origin of the brand. Now, just a final slide to go back to that very involved consumer purchasing process. The key areas that lights up when we look at the results of the study is specifically price for premium and then brand and product intrinsics there. The pre-purchase search, which is really important because it relies and goes back onto memory, tasted it before. Then looking at the post-purchase evalu evaluation of alternatives, sorry, and also looking at past experience and going back and post-purchase evaluation. I've purchased it before, so there's an experience. I place it in my memory and I have tasted it before, so I will go back there and go to my purchase, skip those steps and go to purchase. Also social cultural factors, specifically social class, playing a big role for the premium wine consumers, and then reference groups, which can be used in both, but more specifically for uh, recommendations by others by the um, non-premium group.
of wine consumers. Thank you for your time and for listening to me. It was an honor to present my research. Thank you, Marlies. I'm sure that now you can appreciate the value of her expertise in business, in academic research, and in the particularities and the unique nature of the South African wine industry. It's clearly important that we understand the consumer choices in an increasingly competitive wine sector. It's both important for the country, for the, for the region, and, acro and across the world. Professor Tablanche Schmidt brings together a unique understanding of the African consumer market with a access and an appreciation of the international research in this field. And that creates a particularly value contri con valuable contribution. What's special about the South African wine industry? What's unique about the choices that South African consumers make? And indeed, what can consumers and researchers and businesses around the world learn from the African experience and research from the University of Stellenbosch Business School? I'd like to thank you once again for joining us. I'd like to a heartfelt thank to, thanks to Professor Teblanche Schmidt for a contribution. We look forward to a rich and ongoing contribution to the University of Stellenbosch Business School, our ecosystem and the wider community in the future. Thank you.